Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the YOLO YED Spring Leaders Summit. Uh, we've titled it the YOLO United Against Hate. So thank you all for taking the time out of your very busy schedules uh, to join us this evening. So my name is Oscar Villegas, a YOLO County Supervisor, proudly uh, representing West Sacramento and Clarksburg. And so we'll, we'll take care of some housekeeping items, uh, first of all, and then some ground rules to get through the session um, this afternoon. So first of all, the meeting is being recorded. Uh, and it'll be available uh, uh, after the meeting to, to share. Uh, so please keep yourself muted unless you are speaking. Uh, and then for the best viewing, uh, select the speaker view setting uh, on, your, uh, on your device and then use the chat feature for any questions or comments and ideas. And we won't be able to get obviously to all the questions and all the comments, but we certainly wanna capture them. So uh, please uh, um, jo join right in. So just very briefly by way of some brief background as a recent uh, horrific events against our AAPI community uh, unveiled against our brothers and sisters. Uh, my, one of our colleagues on the Board of Supervisors, Gary Sandy, asked that the Yolo County Board of Supervisors uh, adopt a resolution denouncing uh, all the hateful acts, uh, the racist, hateful comments, the xenophobia against our AAPI community. And subsequently, many of the other uh, cities and school districts uh, throughout Yolo County uh, followed suit and did the same. Um, but during the meeting, it was very clear to all of us, I think those of us that were part of that meeting and many of you were part of that meeting, it was very clear that we needed to do a little bit more. And uh, so during that public testimony portion, particularly it was very clear. So using the existing format that we already had in Yolo County, a structure called the Yolo Leaders Forum, uh, which receives staff support from the local agency formation commission in YOLO. And thank you, Christine, for all the work that you've done in helping to put together uh, the event this evening. Uh, the idea was pitched uh, to bring together a range of folks who can help us understand and process uh, really what is happening to, to our AAPI community. Uh, so we hope tonight's conversation will provide some healing, um, certainly inspire some hope and signal loud and clear to the entire world the solidarity that exists here in Yolo County as we continue our collective work in fighting these injustices and reckoning with the issues that face our, you know, face our communities and, and the world of the race relations once again. And so as we go through the range of emotions, it's important to hear from many different perspectives and what weighs certainly heavy on one of us, it weighs heavily on all of us. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover tonight, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. So we have two, uh, we'll begin this evening with two uh, prominent elected officials uh, who could not attend in person. They're extremely busy, but they were gracious enough to provide us with a short clip. Uh, so I wanted to share their support and encouragement of, the, uh, of tonight's uh, event. So you'll hear first from Congresswoman Doris Matsui, who has represented this region um, for the last 16 years and currently represents West Sacramento, the Eastern portion of Yolo County. Uh, she's worked hard to strengthen local flood protection, ensuring quality, affordable health care. She promotes a clean energy economy and creates uh, cre and supports creating a vibrant uh, a region where all of our, our families can live, uh, work, and play. Uh, and then we, uh, following her comments, we'll hear uh, from Senator Pan, uh, who represents District 6 uh, in Sacramento. That's part of Sacramento and West Sacramento, Elk Grove, and the unincorporated portions of Sacramento County. Uh, Senator Pan is a, a pediatrician, a former UC Davis educator. And in 2010, Dr. Pan was first elected to the state assembly. And then in 2014 was elected to the state Senate. Uh, he's devoted his professional and political career uh, toward helping the community uh, stay safe and stay healthy. So I think Christine, at this point, we can jump right in and uh, pro provide the videos. Hi everyone. And thank you for joining us today for this important conversation. I'd like to thank the Yolo County Board of Supervisors and our community partners who convened this event to have these difficult but critical discussions. We are here under upsetting circumstances, given the sharp rise of anti-Asian violence and discrimination here in our region and across the country. These community discussions are vital to express the fear the emotion and the pain that AAPI communities are facing locally. None of us should have to live in fear for yourselves or your loved ones. Moving forward, we must all take this first step of honest conversation to do all we can do to root out this systemic problem plaguing our society. 
Unfortunately, the rise in violence we see is connected to the recent hateful rhetoric we have seen at the highest levels of our government, seeking to divide us by making us fear the other, rather than unite around the many more things that make us all valued community members. Last week, I had the honor of testifying in front of the House Judiciary Committee to share my personal history and provide valuable context to the danger of ignoring these racially charged attacks. The history of incarceration of Japanese Americans, the history of exclusionary policies our country has enacted are not just stories from the history books for many residents here. They are stories from our families, the stories of our lives. Yet, like many of you here, I still believe that this is a great country, that we are capable of moving forward with a shared vision for our future built upon basic human dignity. I hope the conversations you have tonight are a step forward toward a more unified region, one where our rich and diverse past is remembered and celebrated and our future looks brighter. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Richard Pan, and I'm very proud to represent Yellow County in the California State Senate. When Supervisor Oscar Villegas reached out and let me know of today's important forum, I was happy to know that Yellow County was taking this step and answering this very difficult moment with the leadership it calls for. I would like to thank Supervisor Villegas and Supervisor Don Saylor for their leadership in putting this forum together. And also thank you to Washington Unified School District School Board Member Jackie Wong for her leadership on this issue as well, and the entire Yellow County Board of Supervisors and everyone participating here today. It has been both painful and disturbing to see an entire community targeted with hate, violence, and intimidation. The videos of our grandparents, mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers being assaulted on the street have rocked us to our core. And very sadly, we have not been immune here in our home of Yellow and Sacramento counties. As chair of the Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, I am working with my colleagues to address the violence in California. And I'm proud to have helped pass 1.4 million in state funding to help support research and data gathering currently underway by a variety of communities and state groups that have formed Stop AAPI Hate but we definitely need our community partners to help stand firm against the hate being directed toward our Asian American sisters and brothers. And that is why your work today is so very important. Thank you for coming together to pull resources and work collectively. The solutions you develop today will make the community stronger for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Oscar, for, for pre presenting the videos from Senator Pan and Congresswoman Matsui. My name is Don Saylor, and I've been a part of the planning group uh, working to prepare this, this session. I just wanna remind folks, if you are not speaking, please mute your microphone uh, so that we, we don't have to enjoy the, the purring of your cat or the, the dishwasher being loaded or any other of those kinds of activities that are going on. I'm, I'm so proud of the, of the program that has been assembled today, and I'm looking forward to hearing from each of the presenters. Uh, we'll in just a second introduce Dr. Robin Magalit Rodriguez uh, to speak and to set some context for us. Following her presentation, there will be uh, a session uh, led by, uh, by Stephanie Lynn from KCRA, and then some facilitated work groups uh, led by Bernadette Austin from the Center for Regional Change and then Daniel Kim, the interim county administrative officer, will will uh, have a panel that that he will moderate that will bring some of the some perspective back back to the to the day. This is a very exciting and interesting program that that as Oscar said, we wanted to do something more than uh, than words on a on a page for a resolution. We happen to be blessed in this region with with uh, deep insights and, and people who really understand uh, the nature and the context of the issues that we're facing today. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez is a professor 
of Asian American Studies and founding director of the Bulosan Center for Philippine X Studies. The Bulosan Center is a research partner with Stop API Hate. And if, if you look on their website, you'll find a regional report published last year, late last year, on the topic of API experiences uh, and, and uh, harassment and various types of, of persecution in our region. Uh, and they're about to update that this year with, an, with a new session, a new piece on, on AAPI experiences uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, during the pandemic. Dr. Rodriguez has published widely on Asian American community issues and focused more recently on Asian American activism. She is a committed community organizer and a social justice activist who helped to create the API Greater Sacramento Regional Network last year to address anti-Asian hate as well as to advocate for vulnerable and marginalized APA, API communities as they've struggled to secure resources uh, for COVID testing and now vaccinations. Uh, she, we, are, we are very fortunate to have her with us here today. So uh, Robin, uh, please uh, share some insights on the context and how we find ourselves in this place today. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you so much for uh, everyone for organizing this event. It is for the most part straightforward to identify acts of anti-Asian hate and white supremacy, isn't it? Or is it? In the recent Atlanta shootings, whether the murders can be attributed to white supremacy is already being contested. That the targeted establishments were massage parlors, which are often racialized as Asian. That the majority of the victims were Asian. White supremacy is managing to escape from view. Recently, a Filipino American in Antioch suffering from a mental health breakdown died days after police officer subdued him and put his knee to his neck in a maneuver not unlike the way George Floyd was murdered last year, but his death has gotten very little attention from the mainstream media. Is it because the common view is that APIs are somehow exempt from racism at the hands of police as model minorities? In my talk today, I wanna to illustrate how anti-Asian hate and white supremacy is often not recognized or it is misrecognized. In the event description for today, there's a sentence that reads, violence towards the API community occurs in cycles punctuated by dormancy. That is true, but only partly. What I and others who do the work I do worry about is that the period of so-called dormancy is in fact when white supremacy continues to be active, where it finds ways to reconsolidate itself in less explicit ways, and where its violence is perhaps even more pernicious. For example, it's when favorable views of Asian Americans dominate, like the model minority myth, which represents Asians as successful and assimilated, when violence still happens, when policies that deny services to poor immigrant Asians are instituted and Asians, not unlike the women who were victimized in Atlanta, are consigned to lives of destitution and poverty and premature death. In this case, it is those who may we not wield guns, but who wield the power of policy who are then responsible for lives lost. When as now, we, are in, the, we in the Sacramento region have been hard pressed to get federal, state and local funds to support testing and vaccination efforts in marginalized Asian communities because our struggles are invisibilized by dominant representations of our community, again, as model minorities, that is white supremacy. And when our histories as people of color are sanitized and we are denied the opportunity to tell our stories as in the ongoing struggle for ethnic studies, not just in the K through 12 system, but even at the UC level, when our youth are made to endure an education that denies who they are and must suffer from deep mental health wounds as a consequence, that is also white supremacy. I would venture to say that it is the most dangerous sort of white supremacy because it can mask itself as being something else. When people who have been doing racial justice work like myself talk about structural racism, it has been code for white supremacy. It is the term we have used, frankly, so that we can try to better engage white audiences and white people in power, like many of you, so that we may actually get our issues heard and better yet responded to. But after years of doing this work, years of not being heard, years of not seeing policies change fast enough, I am exhausted and I'm fed up. I am tired of being gaslighted 
made to feel as if I'm crying wolf when I point out examples of structural racism from my very own life or from the research I have done. I am going to name structural racism for to what it is today, white supremacy, and I will speak to its most more explicit and more subtle manifestations. I'm tired of skirting around the term white supremacy in favor of terms like structural racism, and thus in my own way, being complicit in its perpetuation. Today, I'll quickly review the history of more explicit forms of white supremacy and anti-Asian hate, and then return to my point about more hidden forms of white supremacy by examining two major stereotypes of Asians, the yellow peril and the model minority. And I'm drawing here in part from my forthcoming second edition of a book that I co-authored entitled Asian American Sociological and Interdisciplinary Perspectives. So let's just start with the yellow, yellow peril stereotype. It's one that is centuries old. It casts Asians and by extension, Asian Americans as economic, political, cultural, and even sexual threats to the West, wanting to take it over. They, they Asians are a peril to be reviled, to be feared, and even to be eliminated. The stereotype is based in Orientalist framings of Asians broadly defined and extended to Asian Americans as the opposite of the ideal Westerner. As the Westerner is rational, kind, and sexually decent, the Oriental is irrational, conniving, and sexually deviant. The West needs to depict the Orient in this light in order to construct itself and its desired image. The threat from Asia was and continues to be military, economic, cultural, and sexual. Hence the recent fears of the dominance of the US economy by the Chinese. In the 80s, it was the Japanese and the so-called Wuhan flu, and even under the surface of discussions of the Atlanta shooting, purveyors of illicit sex. In the last century and a half, the American citizen has been defined over and against the Asian immigrant. Asian immigrant Asians immigrating to the United States from the 19th century onward have been figured as a yellow peril, threatening to displace whites somehow, taking away their jobs or their land. Yet Asians as the yellow peril, Asian Americans, are figuratively and literally linked to disease and decay. Do, you, do we think that Chinatowns exist because the Chinese chose it? or because structures of white supremacy attempted to contain and confine the Chinese and other Asians. The yellow peril stereotype is not always at play, but arises at different most moments of crises, economic, political, cultural, and of course, most recently public health crisis. During such times, an external agent such as the yellow peril unites real Americans. Orientalist racializations of Asians as physically and intellectually and morally different from whites predominated, especially in periods of intense anti-Asian labor movements. They culminated in institutionalized discrimination, such as immigration exclusion acts and laws against the Chinese in 1882, Indians in 1917, Japanese and Koreans in 1924, and Filipinos in 1934. In the context of war, Asian Americans were figured as threatening as during World War II with the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans and the racial profiling during the world war on terror launched after 9-11. Of course, the yellow, yellow peril also operated to justify US and colonial and Cold War adventures from the Filipino American War of 1898 to World War II to the Vietnam and Korean Wars. The opposite of the yellow peril threat is the model minority, the other dominant stereotype of Asian Americans. When not seen as threatening to the nation, Asian Americans are upheld as almost outwhiting whites with their, out, their high scholastic achievements, low incarceration rates, residential integration, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, and more. This seemingly positive stereotype has gained currency because like all stereotypes, it fits various preconceptions and racialized ideologies. And it works to denigrate Asian Americans, even as it purports to praise them. The model minority is cast as subservient and obedient. As a model minority, Asian Americans can be successful, but not considered assimilated enough to be seen as everyday citizens, much less civic and corporate leaders, but I suppose in Yolo County, there's some exception to that. But nevertheless, in a broad sense, the model minority is typically not considered to be American enough because at the end of the day, they're not white. The model minority myth works not only to limit Asian Americans, but also to uphold dominant ideologies of US race relations. The fact that a minority can achieve in the United States supports the American notion of a meritocrat 
meritocratic, meritocratic society, and that somehow it doesn't discriminate. The US gets cast, the model minority myth, as enlightened and colorblind. Though I can't get into the full history here, it's notable that the model minority myth emerged at the height of the civil rights movement. At a time when blacks called out white supremacy in the US, a counter discourse of the United States as supportive of minorities was marshaled. And that was the model minority myth, one that's continued to dominate for over 50 years. The model minority, somehow demonstrates to the nation and the world that the US isn't racist. The stereotype in effect divides minorities, pitting one good group against another bad group. Lost within this dichotomous stereotypes are the many Asian Americans who experience economic insecurity, poverty, discrimination, segregation, underfunded schools, and the like. Asian Americans are not monolithic. To conclude, we are all, every single one of us, caught in the structures of white supremacy, whites along with people of color. White people cannot deny how white supremacy privileges them. Asians too have to grapple with how we have been recruited to uphold white supremacy as its model minorities. In fact, all people have to grapple with how white supremacy recruits us to be pitted against one another. Yet among the various groups, there are some who already wield the power to be able to make systemic change. And more often than not, those who wield that power are white. And sometimes they may be people of color, including Asian Americans, who lack the critical consciousness to understand how they may be unwitting, unwittingly perpetuating white supremacy. I realize this is a source of great discomfort for many of you to hear, but I am not here to paper over the truth. The task ahead of, uh, for those of you who wield the power is to grapple not just with more obvious forms of white supremacy, but the forms that hide from view. It is constant, intentional, challenging, and painful work to do the work of dismantling white supremacy, but we must do it. The time has always been now. Thank you. Well, and thank you so much for your presentation. Know that you have you boiled down a, a lifetime of study and experience into just a little about ten minutes, and we very much appreciate that. Uh, we uh, it's it's such a powerful sharing. Uh, thank you, and uh, I know that people can look on your website, and if you wouldn't mind using the chat feature to include maybe a reference or two that people can follow up. You you mentioned at least one book that you have. Published. I know you have other other materials that would help help the folks attending here to follow up on the more substantive details that that you have shared here. So, and I hope others use the chat feature in similar way to share information that we don't have time today to to share in, uh, verbally. Oscar, yep. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Robin. Wow, that was. Uh... Uh, I can only imagine. Uh, thank you so much. It's quite powerful. And it's unfortunate we don't have enough time. I think I could listen to you all night for sure. Uh, there's so much more to be provided. So we're hoping that this, uh, th this evening is just the beginning of the conversation. So thank you again. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on. We are still on schedule. So the next uh, part of the program is a, uh, an opportunity for folks to share some personal experiences, as I said, as a result of the recent board meeting. And uh, so we have a panel of local speakers that's gonna be moderated by our own uh, Stephanie Lynn. And uh, so the panel consists of Jenny Tan, who's the Yolo County Public Information Officer, uh, uh, Lisa Yep Salinas, who's a community advocate, and then Steve Hiramoto, who's a retired farmer and a community advocate. And so I'll just very briefly uh, read a little bit about uh, Stephanie. So she, as you know, she's a TV journalist uh, working with KCRA. Uh, Ms. Lynn has a very distinguished broadcasting career here, and I'm going to just cut this short because there's a lot to read about Stephanie. Her career includes working at ABC 2020 in New York, along with assignments at CNBC Fast Money, the Today Show. Uh, she worked on audience operations with uh, Late Night with Jimmy Fallon uh, and Saturday Night Live. Uh, she was recognized by the Associated Press for the best spot news covering the recent campfire. And uh, Miss Lynn uh, was also crowned Miss Asian America 2015 and using that title to actively advocate for diversity and inclusion in companies around the world and used this platform to speak extensively on the topic. And so uh, welcome Stephanie and thank you so much for your willingness to participate uh, this evening with us. 
floor is yours. Thanks very much, Oscar, um, for that very kind introduction and, of course, for um, organizing this incredible event. And thank you, of course, to the Board of Supervisors as well and uh, Yolo County for recognizing the importance of hosting a discussion like this. Um, I also do want to take a minute to recognize uh, the folks on the panel with me today. Uh, we have Steve Hiromoto. He is a Clarksburg farmer. I believe he's retired, but uh, actively, um, you know, advocating on behalf of the Asian American community. Um, his family was sent to internment camps um, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, and he is working to preserve Clarksburg history um, through uh, restoring an 1883 Japanese uh, schoolhouse. So he's here with us live today. Uh, we also have Lisa Salinas. She is also a community advocate. Um, and she shared a number of recent incidents that she had uh, with uh, blatant uh, racism while she was out shopping in the local community. And uh, by speaking up about it, um, that ultimately helped uh, lead to a resolution um, that was passed recently by uh, the Yolo County Board of Supervisors um, condemning anti-Asian hate and xenophobia. Um, and a number of her um, experiences are also published in the Sacramento Bee. Um, we also have Jenny Tan here with us. Uh, she's the public information officer with Yolo County. I've had the pleasure of interacting with her quite frequently through our work covering uh, the coronavirus, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, she's the mother of um, young children. Um, she's shared with me that she's had discussions with her children about you know, um, encountering racist incidents out in the community. And um, she's also had some experience um, with um, some difficult folks out in the community uh, via social media, which she uses to communicate a lot of important information out uh, to folks. Um, so, you know, with that, um, I'd like to start with a question to all of our panelists here, and then we'll go into your specific platforms. But just to, to everyone who's um, on the panel here today, you know, what have your reactions been to the recent um, uh, hate incidents and how have they impacted you personally? Uh, should I go ahead, Stephanie? Absolutely. Yeah, this is Steve. Uh, also, at this time, I wanted to thank the uh, county and the supervisors for uh, sponsoring this program, I think, uh, and hopefully it's uh, very enlightening for everyone. Um, it, it's uh, very tragic what's taken place. Um, and I, I get the uh, Asian newspapers as well. And uh, uh, you know, events are ongoing almost daily. You, you find, uh, you know, at one quarter of our state to uh, another part of our country that's uh, being affected. Um, personally, um, uh, so far, uh, you know, uh, thank goodness I haven't uh, personally been, uh, you know, affected, but um, uh, I uh, follow the Buddhist religion and uh, one of our sister churches in Los Angeles was recently uh, vandalized. And uh, I, I'm sure attribute uh, that uh, vandalism by, um, you know, uh, by hate, racial hate. Um, it's uh, something that's, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, very hard to uh, uh, understand and turn around. Uh, you know, we can put the blame on mentally ill and everything else, but uh, uh, as uh, we know, uh, history seems to repeat itself, and uh, it seems like more and more uh, cyclic. And, and uh, uh, at the root of a lot of this is uh, uh, an event or a current pandemic, or maybe the war issue or uh, uh, yellow peril issue that uh, kind of triggers folks to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, take the offensive. So uh, go ahead. I'll speak next. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Jenny and I'm the public information officer for Yolo County. And when I started thinking about this last week, it really came to mind for me that the trauma that people go through when they experience racism or discrimination is sort of like a cycle. You know, you go through the experience the first time that it happens to you, you get angry, you get emotional, you question why you specifically were targeted, why it happened to you. And then there's almost nowhere for this anger or these feelings to go, but internally. And then the feelings get buried under everyday life, you know, under work life, under being a parent, under 
looking strong, you know, doing the things that you have to do every day. They, they get buried, but then they never get resolved. And then another incident happens or something you hear in the news makes this cycle start all over again. Even for me this morning, when I started thinking about this conversation that we were gonna to have today, I started to get emotional about it because those feelings and those experiences that I had gone through before, either when I was younger or when I was out with my kids, all of those experiences and those feelings came back and it made me angry. It made me question, you know, why, why us again, right? So I think it's important that we keep in mind that these incidences, they, they happen and then they stay with us. So you, you have Asian Americans, you have Black people, you have Muslim people, you have people in the LGBTQ community where incidences like this happen to them and then it just stays with them, where people are shouldering this burden, this invisible burden every day that only gets harder every year. So for me, this is, that's what I thought about for that question. I'll go next. Uh, for me, when I've been hearing and seeing these, the re recent escalation and deaths, my first thought was, thank God I live in Yolo County. Thank God when I went to the local officials, public elected officials, and told them my story, they believed me. And then all of our allies in the Latino, Black, White, Jewish, Muslim, API, LGBT community stood by me so that we could try to protect, at least in our postage stamp of the world, that we could do the work before it got really, really horrible. And it also gave me a brand new hero. My hero is that 75 year old Taiwanese woman when the racist of 39 years old punched her in the face, she picked up a stick and beat him to self-defend herself. She survived. He left on a stretcher. The GoFundMe account for her is almost up to a million dollars. She is poor. She is an elderly. She's an immigrant. She is still physically damaged. And she is donating that almost a million dollars to fight racism against API hate. And she said, I will fight racism to the death which she did and she's surviving and she's our new hero. So it doesn't matter what your age, what your income level, what color, how long you've been in the country, you can help the community, you can help every person. So that's my takeaway. And I'm grateful for all of you in Yolo County. You've been a beacon of light that has influenced Sacramento throughout California. And I heard at a meeting with Ruth at a papa that we are influ influencing nationwide the resolution as an opening conversation. Absolutely, speaking up is such an important first step and um, the steps that Yolo County has taken with that resolution, I think has sent a, a ripple effect to other areas. For example, Sacramento recently also passing our own resolution out here condemning uh, anti-Asian hate. Um, you know, this next question is for Steve. Now, do you see any parallels between the time your family was sent to internment camps and now in terms of people's behavior towards Asian people? Well, uh, as, far, as far as parallel issues, um, I, I really couldn't comment on that. We're, we're still in an isolated area, fortunately, um, but uh, I, I do worry about uh, my uh, daughters, for instance. They live in a, a major metro areas and uh, one of them uh, always sends me emails and say hey dad you know you better not go walk uh, at a certain spot or shopping somewhere else we heard that you know you, uh, you might get in the get uh, getting a problem and so uh, they're feeling that and um, I, I certainly um, don't see that as a proper way for them to have to go through life at this point. Uh, they, and of course they have their own children as well. And um, really hate to see um, the stigma carry on through my family. Um, but as far as um, the uh, probably hatred that existed after or during and after uh, World War II, um, I, I think it was um, 
uh, really the uh, hard work ethics of uh, the re the returnees from the concentration camps that um, you, know, you know basically try to uh, illustrate that you know they're they're American citizens and you know they're here for a purpose they escaping uh, poverty and uh, uh, a worse place uh, for a better life. And so hopefully that, you know, will continue. Um, so uh, that's kind of what I have to say. Yeah, and, and you're, you come from a multi-generational family that's been here for quite some time. Now, have there been any sort of discussions that you, you and your family have had, whether it's, you, you know, between you and your parents or that conversations you've had yet with your children or grandchildren about, you know, how to deal with instances of discrimination or racism in the workplace or just even out in the street? Well, yeah, you know, you naturally are depending on the degree of uh, uh, the uh, attack, uh, be it verbal or what, you know, it just uh, uh, try, try to remain out in the open, uh, try to garner help from those around you. Um, you know, if, if it's uh, uh, that, uh, to a higher degree, certainly I hope the uh, police uh, or law enforcement would be able to uh, uh, assist. And um, uh, other than that, you know, it just, uh, seems like as uh, you know, for speaking for myself, uh, you don't go looking for trouble. Uh, you you try to you know uh, stay to yourself, and um, hopefully, you know, that's enough to kind of uh, blend in. Unfortunately, I mean, it's not um, hopefully a cowardly thing to do, but uh, you know, it's just uh, uh, we all need to uh, practice some kind of uh, precautions. Uh, you know, no matter who you are, uh, you can feel when uh, something's uh, uh, you're feeling jeopardized. So, um, but again, you know, uh, hopefully my at least my daughters would you know uh, have the sense to go to somebody and uh, be able to uh, get immediate help if they're put in a predicament where they're uh, you know, endangered or or uh, similar. Thank you, Steve. And I want to direct that same question over to Lisa and Jenny. You know, I, I know, Jenny, you know, you have young children. Um, you know, what sort of conversations do you have with your kids about instances of racism and discrimination? And have your kids experienced uh, that sort of bullying in school? So every year, without fail, I have at least one or experience at least one incidence of racism or discrimination. And Lately, it's been when I've been with my family, with my kids, and not every incident is full of violence. You know, the incidents can span the spectrum. They can be obvious and overt, or they can be subtle and covert. And one story comes to mind, and it actually happened with one of my sons at his elementary school. Uh, one day when this happened before COVID, uh, my husband and I had the opportunity to pick up one of my sons from school. So we were there, the bell rang, kids are coming out of class. We see my son coming towards us. And then we also see another child who is looking at my son and then stretches his, the corners of his eyes upwards with his fingers. And my husband and I both stop and my husband asks the boy, what are you doing? The boy's grandmother comes up and starts apologizing, right? She can see right away, okay, that's not appropriate, that's discriminatory. However, the principal of the school comes over hearing that we're having a discussion and she says to us that the boy doesn't mean anything by it. And I was shocked to hear this from the principal. I was thinking, you know, how do you know he didn't mean anything by it in the two minutes span of this happening, right? And if the boy didn't mean it, then it doesn't mean that this can't be a learning opportunity for everyone that's present about that specific action and the trauma that's attached to that action. And you shouldn't dismiss the feelings or the distress that was brought up in my husband or I by seeing this, this boy do that. And then afterwards, my principal, the principal decided to talk to us in her office. <laughs> she pulled us into her office to talk about this. And the principal is supposed to be the person who 
oversees the education, the health of all the students on campus. And we had a discussion with her. I left unsatisfied. You know, she was still defending the student. She could not see it from the perspective of Asian Americans who are under this trauma of seeing that action uh, against us. So there are action, actions like this that happen every day that help to perpetuate the ignorance and the attitude that it, it's fine, it's okay in our country, right? And a lot of times these go unnoticed because they're small, but they do happen all the time. With my son, you know, he saw this and he knew that there was something weird in the situation, but he couldn't quite put it into words. He didn't really, you know, kids at that age, they don't really have a vocabulary for this, right? They don't know how to put those emotions into words and kind of explain things. So we went home and I had to explain to him about racism, about discrimination, that it can come in a lot of different forms, that it's okay to be emotional about it, that um, it's okay to be frustrated and to be angry, but what you do with those emotions is, is what we can control, right? Um, so I had a conversation with him about how to be how to turn that into a positive, how to educate people about that, that it's not his fault for looking a certain way or for being in a certain culture or for you know being who he is, right? And a, a kid in elementary school. And we continue to have those conversations. You know, that was not the first conversation I've had with my son, unfortunately, but we continue to have them. You know, whenever there's an incident that happens in the news, I try to have a talk with my kids about how this may impact them, about what it means for our family, for our culture, even for their age, you know, to really show them that there is, a, there is discrimination that happens on all levels, that there is privilege that happens on all levels, and that it, they really should be more aware of these things to be self-aware, either to protect themselves or to protect others. And if it does happen to someone else while they're there, that they do have the ability and the right to stand up and say something um, in these situations. Elisa, would you like to add anything to that? I have uh, three children and two grandchildren, and my husband is Latino. And so the conversations that I have with my family are not only reflective of what happens with the racism against Asians, but also racism against Latinos. And so we have had to um, talk with the public schools and also with um, different situations. But our children were always trying to stand up for yourself. Um, and also we made sure that they were very athletic for any type of self-defense that they would need to have. And um, when they were growing up in Davis, a couple of them were assaulted, but um, they were really strong athletes. So they were able to fight back. Um, and also just using the words and helping them understand their value as a child of God and that everyone is valuable. Um, and also I made sure to really Sure, that they that my children understood their culture and their history, um, that they knew what the Chinese Exclusion Act is, that they knew what the Japanese internment camp was, that they knew that the, if there would be no Cesar Chavez without the Filipino farm workers and, and Uncle Leo and the leaders, and that they knew their Latino history and they knew their American history and their Black history, so that they would be well equipped to be able to stand up for their rights and to fight. So then my daughter has this great story about when she went to Cornell University and I think it was like the third week and she was in the labor uh, department and the teacher said, does anybody know who Cesar Chavez is or the Chinese Exclusion Act the next week? And she graduated from Cesar Chavez Elementary in, in Davis and so, you know, right there, she was ready to, to let to let everyone know because it's like, why wouldn't you know? It's a holiday in California. And what do you mean you don't know about the Chinese Exclusion Act? Don't make me worried. You don't know what the Japanese internment camp is. So really knowledge is power as well as being able to physically protect yourself and to know 
your local government and who the people to call to, to help you, whether stranger danger or other things. And we have to help each other out. When I moved first up here to this division in Woodland, it was my elderly neighbors that needed help because they were from other countries and they were being harassed. And so we would do the charades and I would call the police for them. Um, and so we need to help each other out to take care of our elders and, and train our children and ourselves to be able to protect other people, especially the vulnerable. But it, it is a very hard thing to go through for sure. And there's a lot of work you have to go through. I mean, I was traumatized six times and I know I'm working through it and there'll probably be more for me to work through, but you know, we're taking lemonades and making limoncello and Cantonese lemon chicken and lemon ring pie. So you guys are all welcome to come over and eat. Sounds like it'll be quite a feast. <laughs> all right. So you spoke to the education piece of it, right? And I know that this is, it sounds like a common thread between what all three of you are, are quite passionate about. Um, so, you know, you spoke about the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, you know, the internment of Japanese Americans, Cesar Chavez. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of uh, us folks in the, um, you know, in, in this community, you know, who are, who are, you know, who are people of color, you know, we, we take the time to, to educate ourselves on this, but there is a wide swath of the population out there that isn't aware of, you know, that, you know, Chinese people were discriminated against, for example. So, you know, Steve, I noticed, uh, I, I, I remember, I recall reading in your bio that, you know, edu educating folks is such an important uh, part of you know your personal platform and it's partly why you're really kind of um, championing uh, the restoration of this Japanese schoolhouse right so can you, can you speak a bit more about the education portion of it and why it's so important well I'm finding that my wife works for the local school school district and so I'm uh, somewhat familiar with what goes on uh, uh, curriculum etc and um, I, I've spoken with history teachers and what and they're not even aware of uh, what had taken place uh, um, uh, with the internment uh, situation against the Japanese Americans during the wartime and uh, so uh, even living in uh, the uh, isolated area of Bayou County that I'm from uh, we have not been exempt from, uh, you know, the uh, repercussions of uh, uh, especially during wartime. A uh, little about my uh, family. My grandfather came to uh, the area in, near Clarksburg in uh, 1898, and uh, he was escaping uh, uh, poor economic and social uh, uh, traumas in uh, his uh, native country of Japan. Uh, he uh, came by himself at an early age to uh, Hawaii for a while and then uh, made his way to uh, the region that uh, he had settled and that uh, where I am uh, from right now uh, and uh, was able to um, work, uh, bring himself in, uh, up to uh, become an owner of a business. He became his own uh, crop farmer. And uh, so uh, as the uh, region um, uh, grew in need of labor, uh, if you recall the Becerra program, a lot of you do, where uh, we had sponsored workers from uh, Mexico coming over. Uh, those uh, folks had to be sponsored by a, a farmer or so uh, to be able to come over to uh, work uh, the fields of Clarksburg or California. And the uh, situation was very similar then. So a lot of folks came from uh, his uh, hometown area and uh, came to uh, came as a uh, farm labor and settled uh, around the uh, Clarksburg area. Um, by the 1920s, there were probably uh, quite a few families. Uh, by now, wives had come, or uh, you know, male order, order brides had uh, uh, come over. Anyway families began appearing. Um, by 1925, the community was large enough where they wanted to uh, build their own um, Japanese schoolhouse, which uh, uh, they did in 1926. And uh, there were probably at least 100 students uh, attending that school uh, from kindergarten through high school, but uh, there were that many uh, in that community. And of course, when the work 
working out uh, began uh, and uh, President Roosevelt's uh, executive order um, uh, cleared the entire West Coast of all Japanese uh, uh, descendants, whether you were born here or not. And so, you know, men, women, and children were uh, taken away from their homes. My father uh, was taken to uh, live at an Indian reservation in uh, Gila, Arizona. And my mother was sent to a uh, prison in uh, uh, area up on Northern California called uh, Tule Lake. And so they spent their war years there. Um, a lot of the folks uh, upon the uh, end of the war uh, chose not to return to the Clarksburg area. And so uh, the numbers really diminished. Um, we still have a uh, social club that uh, is comprised of some of the uh, original families from uh, those early times. And we, we try to uh, get together uh, both socially and try to um, uh, keep the history of that area uh, going and intact. But uh, unfortunately, uh, age takes you know, uh, uh, a lot of the uh, members and uh, a lot of the families don't know what to do with uh, their artifacts and remembrances. And you know, a lot of the younger kids don't have anywhere to put it. So uh, I've become kind of a repository for a lot of these items. Uh, and so therefore my interest, the schoolhouse that you speak of has, uh, is no longer there as something that I can, uh, or my group can use as a, a historical um, display place. Uh, but the group in Clarksburg uh, is trying to resurrect uh, the original schoolhouse uh, that served the community in Clarksburg in uh, 1883. And so I've uh, become a member of uh, that organization. And uh, I see that facility as uh, a place that I can uh, display a lot of uh, the artifacts and things that I have now and try to perpetuate the history of uh, the uh, Japanese American community that once existed in the Clarksburg area. Thank you very much for that. Um, just to, to wrap things up here, and obviously uh, so many more questions coming out of this great discussion, um, but just last question for all of you real quick, and because we just have about 60 seconds here, um, you know, what is your ask of the community and policymakers here to address this issue of anti-Asian hate in the community? I'll start, or I'll, I'll be really quick. Um, I wanna tell people, take, take the blinders off your eyes, at least one, right? At least one blinder off. You know, don't just say, I'm sorry. Don't just say, you know, make excuses. Like really think about it, right? Asian people, black people, Muslim people, everyone on the spectrum, those that have experienced discrimination, have experienced the spectrum of, of this their entire lives. So dismissing it or making it less than hurts. So, you know, do something, help someone, speak out. Everyone has power, no matter their position, no matter their station in life, their age, their ethnicity, everyone has power. The world is not perfect. The world is, can be bitter, it can be hateful, but we can all act to make the, better, the world a better place. Even small actions, right? Speaking up for another person, standing up, making sure that if you see that someone is leaving late at night, you go, hey, let me walk you to your car or you see someone saying something to another person, you say, hey, you know what? I don't think that's appropriate. Um, so it's gonna take a lot of steps. You know, this is not a one size fit all or one action kind of solves a problem, but you know, open your eyes, be self-aware that this is happening every day to, every, to a lot of different people. My request is to understand that this, this violence and hatred towards API hits every sector that we know of. It hits healthcare, it hits education, safety, it hits small businesses, it hits employees, the university, public safety for everyone. It's hitting children, families, workers, singles, seniors, everyone. And if we can address this of what we can do to be more loving, what can we do to help these people that have been traumatized to not be traumatized and to move forward so that our biases are not destroying people's lives, then we will be much stronger as a community. And I thank you, Yolo County, for being a beacon of light. You're much further than other counties across um, 
America and throughout the world. This problem is happening throughout the world. So as we work together creatively to make it better, it will be a shining light for everyone else. Very good, Steve, uh, 10 seconds. You wanna chime in on this? Oh, yes, I, I think as far as the county level, uh, I, I'd like to see them uh, uh, assist me in being proactive, not in myself, but uh, you know, uh, through education, I, I think uh, more, especially young people need to be aware of uh, uh, contributions of uh, Asian Americans uh, and uh, you know, um, visibility is uh, actually becoming uh, more common nowadays. We have uh, Naomi Osaka just you know won the tennis uh, in U U.S. Open. We have uh, Colin uh, Marikawa, that's a PGA golf champ. We have uh, The Rock and everybody else. But uh, I, I think uh, publicly, um, more and more Asian Americans are becoming uh, visible. And uh, so hopefully uh, an appreciation uh, of um, what uh, they've done and uh, uh, Asian in general um, can be uh, uh, passed along to young people after all. If they're going to and from work on their uh, Toyota Tundra, you know, guess where that came from. Very good. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time and your insight and for opening up and sharing such personal stories. Um, also, I know that, you know, KCRA, we're working on a special with regards to anti API hate and just solutions uh, that the community is working on to help address this issue. And that's going to be um, airing, I believe, this Thursday at seven o'clock. So, um, thank you again to uh, Oscar and the Yolo County Board of Supervisors for having us. I'll toss it back to you. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move on, Bernadette. It's uh, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thanks, Christine. If you want to pull up our options for breakout rooms. Um, so this afternoon, you've heard from uh, some leaders, experts, and community members, and now it's time for you to share your thoughts. We're going to break out into four rooms, so you'll get to choose. Um, and this will be an opportunity for us to connect a little bit more with the fellow attendees here. Now, bear in mind, we only have about 15 minutes, um, but in this time, I'd like you to share some of your initial thoughts on this really important topic. Because we have limited time, please be gracious listeners and also generous speakers who are concise so we can allow as many people as possible to share this space in the breakout rooms. Also note that this is not the end. Uh, please stay tuned for the powerful closing panel where we discuss what actions we can take here in Yellow County. So I'm gonna briefly describe each of these five options. The first group I'll be moderating on intercultural dialogue. This group is gonna focus on brainstorming opportunities to facilitate dialogue and cultural understanding. This might involve brainstorming ways to highlight the diversity of our county's Asian populations, as well as to find ways to connect with other groups that are facing hate and injustice. This group will focus on building understanding across diverse populations. The second group is gonna be moderated by Robin Rodriguez. It's gonna focus on storytelling, listening, and mobilizing for change. This group will explore opportunities to elevate individual experiences of racism and various forms of marginalization, exclusion, and exclusion rooted in the structure of white supremacy. It will also give some visibility to the way that APIs have collectively organized towards structural transformation. Attendees might come up with ways to leverage events and the media to share stories about how to put a human face on these experiences. These activities will focus on elevating and empowering voices in the AAPI community. The third group will be moderated by Tara Thronson and will focus on safety. So this group is gonna focus on some near-term opportunities to increase real and perceived safety. This group will focus on public safety and mental health services. And the fourth, but certainly not least, a group is going to focus on healing and is moderated by Jackie Wong, who's also part of our closing panel. This group will focus on near-term opportunities to create healing spaces, such as maybe healing circles. Ideas might include reaching out to spiritual leaders or holding real and virtual spaces for victims and survivors. In contrast to the intercultural dialogue group, which is the first group, this group is really gonna be internally focused on the individual rather than externally focused on the collective. This group will focus on emotional and spiritual healing. So please take a moment. Uh, we should be prompted in just a moment if you haven't already to pick one of these groups um, and again, please stick around um, afterwards. If you have any problems, um, check in with Christine and she can probably help you uh, with assigning yourself, for example, if you're on the phone. All right, thanks so much. Just as folks are arriving, I just wanna thank folks for being really generous and really candid and um, really honest in these groups. Um, hope you all got a lot out of it. 
Um, and I, I believe that some of you are interested in some of the recordings. These um, breakout rooms weren't recorded, but hopefully you'll be able to share um, the, the main recording and then also some of the ideas, thoughts that came up. Um, and we'll move into a section on action items. Thank you, Bernadette. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Kim. I'm the interim CAO for Yolo County, and it's my honor to be moderating this distinguished panel. Uh, each of the three panelists are leaders within our Yolo community. Uh, first, we have Gloria Partida, the mayor of the city of Davis. Welcome, Mayor. Uh, next, we have Shelton Yit, uh, a former trustee of the Yolo County Office of Education. Thank you, Shelton. And finally, we have Jackie Wong, our vice president of the Washington Unified School District in West Sacramento. Hi, Jackie. Thank you all for participating. Now, I have a number of questions, but I think in the interest of time, I'm probably going to have to cut down the number of questions I ask. But I do want to ask all of you uh, kind of what ideas or suggestions from the great breakout room resonated with, with each of you. So why don't we start first with Shelton? I mute myself. Um, <laughs> one of the things that um, we've been hearing over throughout the day um, was the importance of, of the whole ethnic studies piece and really um, having that as, as a base. It's not, a, as, as Kelly would say, it's not the cure-all. It's just one of those things of having that information and making sure that um, people um, across the spectrum of, of, of groups um, understand the importance of, uh, and, and the roles that everyone has played in terms of our society, in terms of the building of our country, everything else. Um, we're not just those people. We're not the ones that have the Chinese restaurant down the street. Our, our, our forefathers are, you know, and all they, they really played an important role in terms of where our society is today. Thank you, Shelton. Mayor uh, Partita, do you have anything to add? Yes. Uh, so I think that we spoke about mental health and safety, and I think that what really resonated with me was uh, the importance of making sure people knew that they could report uh, hate crimes and incidents, and that uh, that message got out uh, into the community and that people knew that there were resources available to them uh, for reporting and that their community was uh, standing behind them. Thank you, Mayor. Jackie, any golden <laughs> nuggets from your group? Um, a lot of golden nuggets, but I, I think just kind of within the context of the entire night. So thank you all for putting this together. Um, I had the um, benefit of being part of the healing group. And what's interesting to me is um, what we were talking about is the, the reactions, the emotions that were raised because of the stories of the earlier panel, right? We talked a little bit about the microaggressions that we all as people of color uh, were experiencing, right? And how that actually is uh, changes DNA as, as research has shown. And that actually transcends generations. And how do we heal from that? What do we do? We talked about the um, possibility of, um, you know, what does restorative justice look like? You know, moving from just perpetrator to victim, right? Using Lisa's story, but also the community has been watching this and how do you heal as a community? And where does that, you know, what is our responsibility to, to, to that, right? In an authentic and real way um, and create spaces. And, and um, I had thought we were gonna report out, I, I was gonna assign Garth to report out, but I will, I will report out um, is that like, and it starts with us as we think about K-12 and COEs, um, or even I would say even pre-K-12, right? What are we doing? What are the education systems? Are we creating safe and healing spaces, right? I've shared that. My daughter didn't feel that it was safe to, to even talk to me, a school board member, about what was going on, which is horrible. Like that she didn't believe that she was going to be believed because nothing was going to happen, mommy. Right? Um, what we shared earlier is that she's so grateful that we're having this. She's like, mommy, you're having an Asian Lives Matter um, forum. And it begins there, allowing her the space and K-12 and all of us allowing space for healing so that she can feel confident in reporting um, as Mayor Partita ha had shared, like the, the, the spaces that the, um, the civic spaces that we are allowing for bullying to be reported. But again, if children don't feel comfortable in their emotion and actually naming 
the um, structural racism that they are being educated thing, that, the, that they are experiencing this, then how can they actually really access the avenues for, for, for justice, right? So how do we actually talk more about healing but I would also say it's not just the victims, but it's us all watching that, right, and talking about it. I don't know if I've, I've done, it, uh, done it justice. Garth spoke about it um, beautifully in terms of just authentic, real emotion, just being real about it and calling it out and calling it in and saying, hey, we can get through this together, right? Um, because I was, I was struck by everybody in that, that subcommittee's um, emotion like the tr their own personal historical trauma that was being raised because just because of the prior panels so thank you jackie while we're on the subject of safety um i think all of you have seen these videos of anti-asian american violence but I, I don't know if you thought this but i was struck by the number of bystanders who did absolutely nothing in the face of this violence so uh, i'm gonna turn to you jackie quickly what do you make of this and um how can we change how bystanders respond um, no pressure here, <laughs> but um, I, I think that um, I know it's about power, right? When you first see it, the people don't know how to, how to react. There is a shock and awe of like just processing, is this really happening? And then the question becomes, what is my role in that, right? And I would say just again, Jenny and others have shared this, is that that's this has happened every year in my life and every year in my child's life right like that they've had friends who watched them get bullied get done the you know slanted eyes things or you know just different things over time how do we actually as educators and uh, community members um just teach teach folks that bystander like that how do we empower young people right how do we empower others um and, and the adults that who stand by too i think jenny was 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 sharing that the principal came over and said oh you know that that they didn't mean anything by it that's a bystander response, right? Seeing it happen, not understanding that there needed to be healing in that moment and a, a validation of the experience, right? So it's not just the kids that we are, um, we have jurisdiction over educating, but also our staff, right? When we're saying that this is not just a student issue, this is also a staff issue because it does actually happen on staff on staff as well, right? And so I would say that one, it's powerlessness. And then um, those who actually are buying, it does harm to them, right? That those who actually, if we don't understand, if we don't create opportunities for people to grasp onto their power to change and intervene and saying it's okay, right? As long as it's safe, right? That it's not, the, you know, there isn't, you know, other forms of um, kind of uh, violence that could happen with the intervention, but actually um, that they can have permission and the power to step in and intervene. That's what we need to teach people, right? Because if, if they could be walking away and doing harm to themselves about the guilt of not doing something as well, right? It's interesting, I, as you all know, that I also um, am an instructor at university. We do bystander um, kind of training on, for example, sexual harassment, but why don't we do that actually when we think about a structural racism? Right, like there, there's a mandate for like, you know, actually I just went through it a little while ago of like we go through this kind of, if you see somebody being sexually harassed verbally or whatever, you intervene and there's training for that. But we don't do that for actually structural racism. And that's something that I would kind of think about, right, um, as, a, uh, as an opportunity. That's a great point. Yeah. Great point. So, so um, turning to the next question, um, maybe Mary Pratita, you can speak to this. Um, how do you think we can promote better relations among Asian Americans and other communities, including other communities of color? So I, I, that's a great question. So I think that it's really important. Uh, the ethnic studies piece has been brought up multiple times and there is a reason for that. The reason being that, you know, learning about other cultures is really important and, and understanding each other is really important. Um, I think that as communities, we can we can extend that we can extend that learning and uh, have more, you know, uh, art and cultural events and and promote as much as we can uh, so that the community is not siloed into their, you know, little uh, areas and, and don't get to interact and don't get to uh, meet their neighbors. Um, I think um, that those, you know, are some of the things that we can do. We, you know, talk a lot about hiring uh, a, a more diverse workforce, uh, and I think all of those things bring um, communities together. 
And I do want to add a little more to the last question. Uh, the Davis Phoenix Coalition is a nonprofit that I've been working with for a number of years now. We work on, um, you know, in diversity and inclusion. And we have uh, once a year we do an upstander carnival for elementary age children. And the purpose being to give people tools or to give children tools. Uh, for what to do when they see a classmate being bullied. And it's very similar to what you do as, as I'm sure they do this for the sexual assault. Um, but, you know, it's sometimes just going over and standing next to that person uh, gives that person an instant ally. Um, and, you know, children are often very afraid uh, to step into those situations. And even as adults, we're very afraid to step into those uh, situations. Um, uh, and so you have to sort of, you have to practice and you have to start young. And so you have to start with children just saying, that's not okay. I mean, you have to have a script, right? For, for when you see that. And just saying that's not okay is, is uh, really easy. Um, and as I said, just standing next to that person. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll tell kids, if you're too afraid to do anything, go and get someone. And that applies for if you see, you know, somebody being, uh, if you see a hate incident happening or a hate crime happening, you know, go and get someone, um, call the police or, uh, you know, just bring more people to the space. And so there, there are a lot of great, um, you know, how to be an upstander, um, instructions that that people can find and I encourage everyone to educate yourself on you know what to do in those situations. Very simple things but they can be really powerful to the person who's aggrieved. Thank you. Uh, Shelton did you have anything to add? I have so much to add but it's like <laughs> we're running out of time but one of the things that I did do is I was you know when we talk about um, meeting with and, and learning more about uh, I started listing all these different people that um, are so important that have a, a voice out there. And I started listening. It's, it's funny, they were all females like Gloria Partida with the Phoenix Coalition. Uh, you know, Jackie, uh, I've worked with Jackie on mental health issues and, and, and we're going through with that. And, you know, Robin with, um, at, you know, with Asian American Studies, uh, I told my group that you know I was a graduate of, of Asian American Studies over at UC Davis, and she's keeping up the good fight. I I, I kept going on and Sandy Holman and and uh, all of them. So we have the the voices out there that we can learn from and work with, and that's important. One of the things that I um, I'm going to borrow from from Ibram. Kendi, um, this one statement that says, you know, um, when all they see is what I am, and he talked about a black man, but I talk about an AAPI man or a Latina or, or, or Native American. And what I am pronounced when I am, what it pronounces what I am, and it, it's, it, we're not a virus, um, but they, they apply that to that. I'm not a criminal you know, on, on the above. And the embodiment of danger, this produces the fear. And this is the fear that is out there that gives permission to the white supremacist and anyone else to, um, to attack. And this is one of the things that, you know, and, and I know that you know, we live in a, a very polarized society and, 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 and it comes down to this one. And I know that Jake, I think Jake is still on the call there, but he was talking about the fabric of a society that, you know, he is learning from or learning to and, and trying to change with things. And, and when we talk about the fabric, it's everyone on this call and it's everyone else out there because each and every one of us has a part of the fabric of society, which each, each are held responsible to make the change. And that's the challenge that we have in front of us. One of the things that Jackie, you spoke about in terms of, you know, um, what is it that we can do as, as an individual? You know, and there's something that we've been teaching kids in elementary school about bullying. It's the same thing. If you see something, say something. 
and it's important. And we have to teach that. We kept hearing throughout this whole evening about educating and about you know, communications and the process. Uh, what is it that will take um, to make sure that everyone understands what it is uh, when they talk about hate crimes? I'm, I really appreciated what happened at the Board of Supervisors meeting yesterday um, with, with um, um, the Anti-Defamation League and, and also the, you know, we had the um, um, Attorney General, or not the Attorney General, but the Attorney, speaking of the Attorney General, we have a new Attorney General, Rob Bonta. Hey, I mean, <laughs> that's cool stuff. But one of the things we learned, I'm sorry, I'm ADD, if you didn't know this. Um, one of the things that, that um, we have to do is that we really need to keep um, this on the forefront and keep educating. As Robin said earlier, you know, we had this, this dormancy that happens. Well, we can't have that happen because things like what happened to Jenny, what happened to Lisa, what happened to, you know, Steve, what happened to all of us? It happens every day. So one of the things that, you know, we have to do, and I, I, I told my group that I was in, you know, I had this, I have an opportunity of meeting with principals across the state of AAPI. We have 100, about 150, 160, 170 of them that I meet with every, every couple of weeks. And we talk about issues around this um, and, and allies within that group. And one of the things, again, it comes down to Jenny and that principle. And I, 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 like I said, I was taken aback and I had to sit back and take a deep breath. But it's one of the things that we're doing in AXA, the Association of California School Administrators, along with the California, um, with the uh, School Boards Association, is we have a whole equity task force that's going on. That's looking at policies across the state making sure our policies meets the needs and meets what it is that is necessary to educate our students at the level necessary to end the cycle that we're in. And so the ability to meet with them, to talk with them um, is so important because I hope that none of them will do what happened to Jenny. I hope that we can continue to move the curriculum forward, you know, we didn't need a, I mean, we need ethnic studies, but it should have been a part of, you know, it's like, what are we missing here? It's something that I took from my Asian American studies experience. And when I first became a teacher and, and, and built it into my curriculum in terms of, you know, one of the things that could happen or, you know, the history of, of the mine, you know, the, 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 mm -hmm. the railroad workers, all the above. I know I, I need to stop, but what can we do? Everything that we're doing in Yellow County is we're at the forefront and it's important. And I really appreciate that. And, and Thank you, Shelton. You kind of answered my last question, which was uh, what is a simple <laughs> concrete thing that we as individuals can do to promote better racial understanding? So I'm gonna quickly turn it to Jackie or Mayor Partita, a quick thing that you would do or each of us could do. Talk to your kids. So I always tell people, do not assume that your children are going to pick up your values by osmosis. You know, just because you are a, you know, a practicing anti-racism doesn't mean that your kids are doing it or that your kids understand that. And, you know, the, the example that Jenny gave with the, with the uh, principal uh, happens a lot, you know, for, for adults because they're uncomfortable. And, you know, they find those conversations to be uncomfortable. Well, you have to take the discomfort out of that and make it just part of growing up. You have to teach your kids to see race, to see color, to appreciate each other. Um, I had a, uh, I have a son who is, who's got cerebral palsy. He's in a wheelchair. And when he was little, uh, kids would stare at him all the time. They would just walk up to him and stare at him. And sometimes kids would even believe it or not, make fun of him because he couldn't walk. And this is just, this is just really kids being kids. And so I would take that opportunity to tell them, say hello, or you can ask 
you know, why he's in this wheelchair. And, but just, you have to talk to your kids. Thank you. Jackie, real quick. I, for me, again, education and acknowledging racism as it is. I think we are all really scared about the reaction. Right, um, and I, I think um, people don't want to hear it because they don't know how our friends will react. And I think you call it out as it is, right? And that's why you know I'm going to double down on bystander training that is rooted in racism, and acknowledging that we are, I'll say, education is rooted in structural racism, right? And unpacking that and calling it out for what it is, and not ignoring it. Thank you, Jackie. I'm going to add one thing. In a post-COVID world, invite someone over to dinner, tell them your story, and that'd be great. And, and listen to that person's story. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Supervisor Don Saylor, who's gonna say a few closing remarks. Don. Thank you, Dan. And thank you to everyone who's been so generous with your insights and your time this evening. I think that all of us have learned a great deal, uh, both intellectually and, uh, and from the heart. But this. Uh, this, this uh, was uh, to, to, to talk about Dr. Rodriguez's comments at the beginning, to not paper over the issues. Uh, that's, that's really critical. I think that there are things that we can as individuals do. There are things that we as communities can do, things our local agencies need to be engaged in. Uh, this is the perfect kind of, of, uh, of topic for YOLO leaders uh, to focus on in one of our YED talks. We don't take, we don't do uh, flip charts and, and uh, sticky notes to, to, to make priorities here. What we do is we take these lessons, these, this deep thought that we've experienced here together back to our jurisdiction and back to our communities and we take actions there. So I think each of us has some challenges here. One thing that, that I always uh, try to do is understand uh, what the, what, what the, what the essence of, a, of another person is. And so when someone tells me a story from their experience, it's critical that, that uh, I listen to that story and accept it as, as their truth and their, their personal experience. Uh, I don't have to have felt it to have empathy for it or to, to believe that it's important to take action. And that's, that's what we have here. There are people on this call from every community in Yolo County. And there are people that we deliberately set up the, the format for today's event so that the, many of the prominent leaders in the API community in Yolo County were featured. If you don't walk away from this uh, with a deeper understanding and appreciation uh, for the value of, of these people in our community, uh, then you're not paying attention, you're not listening. Uh, together, Yolo County is strong. Uh, we are, we're like a redwood forest where the roots grow down into the ground and intertwine with one another. And that's how we're able to stand when the winds hit, is that we're intertwined together in a very deep, connected way. Uh, that's, that's who we are. This session has been recorded. It's a, it'll be available to all who registered and to others who asked. And we will, we also have been keeping track of the chat feature tonight. I hope that you've had a chance to take a look. A couple of the highlights in the chat section, uh, Jim, our colleague Jim Provenza has included references for ways to report hate crimes. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez has given us a few references for additional sessions and literature. I, I think that, the, that we've just touched the tip of the iceberg for the, the stories and the truths that have impacted those who've spoken and we have yet to hear the hundreds and thousands of other stories that are too tender to be spoken now or from folks who, who uh, were too frightened uh, or, or too leery of sharing their, their, their uh, experiences with us tonight. I, I'm deeply uh, in, indebted to my colleague, Oscar Villegas, uh, for our shared work on tonight's program and to all the members of the, of the planning group who've worked so hard to put this together in a short time. We usually spend about three months planning one of the sessions. We'd spend about, about three weeks uh, doing this one. And, it, and I'm, I'm really, really so grateful to you all. Um, Oscar, did you have anything that you would like to add before we close? I just think this was a wonderful evening. Thank you all for taking the time. I really do believe this is the beginning of something special. Uh, please give us your feedback if you didn't get the opportunity to talk or be heard this evening. Please don't 
don't be shy, share, share with any of us because uh, we want to keep the momentum, continue this conversation, more to come for sure. Thank you. There will be future YOLO leader sessions. And if you have ideas or topics you'd like to have us focus on, uh, you can email Christine Crawford uh, at, the, at that, uh, her email address. So thank you all and uh, go out and do good work for others. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.